I'm honored to be here uh, at the American Philosophical Society and given the opportunity to uh, think and talk some more about the family Whitman, which has captured my attention and my energies for the last two or three years. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how I came to write a book about Whitman and his brothers. Um, when uh, I, I had, I think, probably a fairly typical experience with Walt Whitman, typical of somebody of my generation who went to public school. I uh, read Oh Captain, My Captain in high school. Uh, and then in college, I actually found myself at an American literature seminar, and we read a lot of Whitman. Um, and uh, um, as an arrogant college student, I wasn't very impressed. Um, we read a lot of the poems of the uh, O oh, Indiana, O oh, Ohio, O oh, Nebraska school. And um, I thought, you know, I just didn't quite understand uh, all the noise that was made about this, this fellow Whitman. Um, <clears throat> I later figured out that we had read only poetry from the 1892 deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. As you probably all know, uh, Walt Whitman was that unusual poet who uh, wrote the same book over again. He published uh, over and over again. He published six, at least six editions of Leaves of Grass uh, in, the, in the course of his career, beginning with the 1855 edition, a slim little little book, and continuing to the uh, well-named Deathbed Edition, 1892, the year he died, which is a quite fat volume. Um, and I learned um, that he had, in, that, in those years, been steadily um, bowdlerizing his own poetry. He had broken up clusters of uh, love lyrics, very sexualized poetry, and spread them out through his later editions so that they didn't have too overpowering an impact. Um, he had been uh, changing the pronouns in some of, some of his poems so that um, a figure who was clearly identified in the 1860 edition, the, the great edition, I believe, uh, as a man, a lover, a lover of the author and, and a man, by 1892 was sort of a woman. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think I can't say that my, um, my tepid early response to him was entirely because of this, but, but it did, it, it was a factor. It was a factor. There, there was a vagueness about the poetry as I read it a, as a college student. Um, in the course of researching this book, I encountered that first 1855 uh, edition of Leaves of Grass. And if any of you are curious about Whitman, maybe you had your own experiences with him in school, maybe you'd like to read him anew, I suggest um, getting a, a paperback copy of the 1855 edition. Uh, it's, it's available from Penguin, from other publishers, costs about a you know, dollar and a half. And it's an extraordinary book, extraordinary. Uh, reading that, one sees why Whitman is considered the most original uh, American poet, the most influential American poet. And um, so uh, <clears throat> for me, it was uh, um, a useful uh, re-education uh, to work on this book. So anyway, <clears throat> but in the, um, in the period of my my ignorance of, of Whitman as a poet. Um, I happened to receive uh, a postcard um, from a friend, uh, um, uh, a, a photo of Whitman. Um, and I, I'll, I'll show it to you now. Um, There we are. Um, so this this is the postcard image that that I got in my little cottage in Berkeley, California, and pinned up on the wall because it was very taking. Um, 
this is not the Walt that I was used to thinking of. Whitman was the most photographed American poet in the 19th century. There are many, many Im images of the guy. The guy, he was, he was a, an ardent self-promoter, very, very, um, very experienced professional journalist. He knew how to get his name out in front of the public and to get his image in front of the public. Um, <clears throat> if any of you have seen books of 19th century portrait photography or just, you know, the kind of photos and daguerreotypes that were taken um, in the mid-19th mid century, you know that the people look frozen and dead, utterly dead. This is largely because, well, they were wearing very stiff clothing, they were wearing corsets, they were worried about appearing prim and, and proper, but also they had to sit still for a minute and a half sometimes. Um, so that in, in those in family photos, the only thing that looks alive is the dog. <laughs> but I found that this image of Walt Whitman had a different quality. Um, there's, there's an aliveness and a, and, and a reaching out in the way he looks at one. Um, this photo was taken in 1854. Uh, when he was completing writing the, the poetry that became the first edition of Leaves of Grass, published 1855. Um, and he was uh, very much into his one of the roughs period. He had, in the 1850s, he was, was one of the roughs. He was working very hard as a spec builder in Brooklyn, uh, putting up inexpensive wooden houses, uh, freestanding houses, most of them, um, borrowing money to do, do the construction, taking out mortgages, then putting them on the market, building house after house after ha house. He was, um, as far as I could determine, a, a quite adequate um, uh, a carpenter himself, but he uh, was especially gifted as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur subcontracting different parts of the job. So he was, he was on building sites every day. He was carrying hammers and planes and other tools around with him. You'll see in his poetry, he, um, he makes a, a lovely fetish of naming the tools that he uses. He used uh, many specific tools as a printer as well. But so he was, um, he was clearly not the kind of literary guy that, um, Emerson was, or uh, Longfellow. The portraits of those were these, uh, are of gentlemen with high collars, uh, often distinguished beards. Uh, you can tell they went to Harvard or Yale. And Walt wants people to know that he's just an American. Uh, so I was, I was interested by this, this particular image. I couldn't quite say why, but like I say, I pinned it up on my wall. And then uh, a couple of years passed, and I heard that Walt had um, had an unusual career during the Civil War. He had been a nurse. Um, in fact, he was very careful never to claim that he was a nurse. He said he was a, a consoler, a visitor to the wounded and sick soldiers. Um, but in fact, he was very, very definitely a nurse. He carried bedpans, he assisted at amputations, he uh, nursed men as they uh, died from typhoid fever and systemic gangrene. He saw the whole thing and worked hard at it. Um, he, um, he, he made his way to Washington where the, where the Union hospitals were all clustered so that all the human debris from all the terrible battles in the Eastern Theater were funneled into Washington. And um, he, uh, he nursed there for uh, roughly seven years. He started in, at the end of 1862, and then he continued to nurse soldiers after the war was over. Um, and by my fairly careful reckoning, he worked in, in the hospitals there were 50 hospitals in Washington, and he visited all of them eventually, but he particularly concentrated on, on the busiest and the most dreadful. 